In this video, I want to introduce an example which we're going to be talking about for the next few videos, which is the example where we have a normal prior distribution as well as a normal likelihood. And in this example, we're going to be talking about the case where we know the variance of the normal likelihood function. And the example which we're actually going to be talking about explicitly is the case where we have a university professor who each year measures the IQs of all of his students. And we're going to assume that in this case, the professor thinks that the data generating process, in other words, the likelihood, is normal about some sort of population parameter theta and with some variance, which we're going to call here sigma x squared. And in this case, we're going to assume that the professor thinks from year to year, the width of this distribution doesn't really change. So the sigma x squared here is going to be known and it's just going to be fixed. So the likelihood function here looks something like this blue line which I'm drawing and it's of course centered on theta. So we're going to assume that this professor has all the sort of scores from this year and he's found that for this particular class the mean score is 60 and sigma x squared here is just going to be 10. Furthermore we're going to assume that the parameter theta is not a known constant in this particular case. And the professor expresses his uncertainty in the parameter theta by saying that it is normally distributed with some sort of mean theta zero and some variance which is called sigma squared theta. And the idea here is that the professor has some sort of estimates on what the sort of basic values of both of these parameters should be for the prior distribution. And we're going to say that essentially what the professor does is he takes the average of all the mean class test scores for the, as long as he's been teaching and he finds that that's 70. And he also sort of looks back and looks at the sort of average deviation of the sort of mean from one another and he finds that the variance here is actually 25. So the professor's views about the parameter before he actually looks at the results from this current year's sort of students are expressed in terms of a normal prior function, which looks something like this with a center on theta zero. So there are two ways of viewing this prior density. One is just a straightforward way of just saying that it's the way in which the professor expresses his uncertainty about the parameter theta. Another way of thinking about it is that essentially the parameter theta, the sort of population mean IQ scores level actually varies from year to year and the way in which it varies is sort of given by this sort of normal distribution here. And the idea in this example is that the professor would like to come up with some sort of posterior estimate as to the likely values of theta given that he has now witnessed his class's data. And I'm writing x with a sort of line underneath it to signify the fact that we've got sort of n observations here x1, x2 through to xn and as I've stated, we've already stated that the mean class score is 60. So the mean of all of these observations is actually 60, the sample mean. So we know in all cases that the posterior density is proportional to the likelihood, the probability of x given theta, times the prior density, which is just the probability of theta. And the reason that we can write that this is proportional to these sort of likelihood times the prior is that the denominator of Bayes' rule doesn't actually explicitly contain the parameter theta. Essentially what's happened here is that all theta dependence has been integrated out of the denominator because the denominator is just a marginal PDF. So we can forget about it, it's basically just a normalizing constant in this circumstance. And essentially what we're gonna show over the next few videos is that if we have a normal likelihood and if we have a normal prior density, then it happens to be the case that we're going to actually prove that the posterior density is also normal and we're going to find both the sort of posterior mean, which I'm just going to call here theta dash, and the posterior variance, which I'm just going to call here sigma squared theta or prime. So we're going to derive the posterior density. We're also going to derive the posterior predictive distribution. So we're going to derive in this case for one observation, what is the probability distribution for this one extra observation given that we have now seen the data. And we're also going to prove that this is normal and we're going to find the parameters of this normal distribution. Finally, a quick note on this example as a whole. I know it's not particularly realistic to assume that we actually know the parameter sigma x squared, 
But you can think about, because this professor has observed this process for a long period of time, in a sense, he has an idea as to the innate variance of it. So perhaps you could think about sigma x squared being better well known than it is in many other examples. Although what I will say is that this is basically a stepping stone example, and we're going to use this example to sort of jump towards examples where we also don't know the parameter sigma x squared, and we're going to have to place a prior on this parameter as well. Finally, just a quick note on the assumption of normality in both the likelihood and the prior. Well, in many examples, it might not necessarily appear to be the case, but the central limit theorem actually says that in sort of situations where there are a large number of additive effects which result in another effect, that the normal distribution actually provides a pretty good approximation to the sort of real distributions that may be going on if we have sufficient number of observations and if there are a sufficient number of additive effects.